Hey, y'all. I'm Bud Elliott, and this is my College Football Summer School Series on Cover 3. I bring on the team experts from the 24-7 sports staff and ask them the questions I care about. No fluff. Which players will be toughest to replace? What position groups are sneakily better or worse than I realize? We get you the scoop on each team in 20 minutes or less. Let's go. Hey, guys. Welcome back. Bud Elliott here on the Cover 3 College Football Podcast. This is my summer school series where we talk about all the top teams, break them down with the experts from 24-7 sports. And today, it's Arizona State, and that means Chris Cartman of Sun Devil Source. Nobody does it better when covering the Sun Devils. Chris, welcome back to the show. Hey, bud. Good to be with you. Absolutely. Man. I think you and our Michigan State site might have been the most accurate and like brutally honest people that we had on this show last year. And hey, look, if you're willing to tell it like it is when it's bad, we know you're willing to tell us when it's good, too. And hopefully things are trending up there for Arizona State. Yeah, I think credibility over the long run comes from accuracy, right? And um, if you sell people a, a false bill of goods, a lot of them are going to come to realize that. And last season, ASU was in a really bad place, probably the worst uh, since I've been covering the program. Um, the NCAA investigation rolling on, a staff that had sort of given up on the recruiting trail and was filling spots in the last minute with their coordinators and showed up on the field. Kenny Dillingham has had a serious... Uh, overhaul that he's had to undertake. Uh, he was benefited from the suspension of the 25 annual new scholarship rule, uh, probably about as much as any program in the country, along with maybe you know, Colorado and Prime, right? Um, they are going to have more than 50 new scholarship players, only 31 returning as of now by my count. And that gives you an ability to more quickly cycle up than what would have been in the case in previous years where you would have had a bunch of guys on your roster that probably weren't good enough to compete or weren't a good schematic fit for you. Uh, I think that in the spring, we saw more than a dozen Division One transfers that are going to impact their two deep immediately, including some of the guys that are probably going to be among their best players. Uh, you look at Xavier Guillory on offense, a wide receiver. Cameron Scadabo looked really good as a running back. Um, so I, I think that pretty much across the board, they have improved their talent. They have, in a lot of spots, added depth and uh, to complement what they have returning and uh, fit the this, this schemes. I think they're in a, a reasonably good place, all things considered. This is probably the toughest one that I've had to do. I've not done Colorado yet. We're, we're recording that next week just because, as you mentioned, there are so many new guys on this roster. And then also – I. I think it's fair to question if some of the guys on this roster last year had their head in the games on a week-to-week -week basis, right? Like some guys maybe weren't fully bought in all the time. Some certainly, you know, were and still played hard. I, I won't even really waste time what they ranked on offense last year because there's so many new pieces. I, I, I'll go right to quarterback. So they they lose Emory Jones, Cincinnati. And I usually lo you know, lose and in, in just because I guess it is technically a loss. They take Drew Prime from Notre Dame. Uh, Trenton Borgay is still there, correct? Jacob Conover from BYU, I saw transferred in, and Jaden Rashada, uh, they, they were the the, uh, the signee for him. Uh, none of these guys had good numbers against good competition, but like at least Pine had some good numbers against sort of average to below average competition. It, is it fair to think he's the starter here? There's an ongoing competition between Pine and Borgay. Um, okay. I think – widely a lot of people may not realize that Borgay played last season at far less than 100 percent he had a foot injury um two years in a row where he had a, a metatarsal that was problematic for him and um pin came loose in it during the season and so he had surgery in january look he still has a, a very average arm and his size and stature is not very good um, ASU was able to beat sort of the, the, the lone hanging fruit of the roster and Drew Pine. Yeah, he was eight and two at, as a starter at Notre Dame, but, um, against the better teams, you saw there was a little bit of a difference there. I think Pine has a better arm. Um, he's got a little bit uh, of, uh, a better ability to get the ball down the field to ASU's playmakers, which opens up the field against better defenses, right? Like that's a very important thing. Um, but uh, Borgay is an operator. He's 70% completion percentage, one of only two quarterbacks in the Pac-12 who did that last year. The other one was at Oregon where Kenny Dillingham was. So you know you're going to get really good operation uh, if you have Borgay. Now, the difference is that you may get squatted on by the better teams, and they may take away quite a bit. And that means you got to have to get the ball in a hurry to those guys who are playmakers, get some yards after the catch, manage it, not turn it over. 
it creates a smaller margin for error against the better teams. And so that's kind of why I think that their upside is probably a little bit overall limited compared to if they had a guy who had some of the physical tools of a Jaden Rashada as a freshman, who's got a better arm, he's a better athlete, he's bigger, he'll end up being, uh, you know, a, a, a tough guy uh, to handle in a lot of respects, but he's not there yet. And that's the reason that um, we're going to probably be continuing to talk about this Pine versus Borgay situation deep into August, maybe even later. I, I liked what I saw from, from Borgay, honestly, when he was inserted midseason. I thought the offense played with with better tempo and better rhythm. And I I watched a decent bit of Arizona State, I guess, for a guy that lives on the East Coast. And he just seemed to operate better, and, and he knew where to go with the ball. He's a little more decisive than Emory Jones was. Not quite as much of a run threat, not as big. So I guess if, if you're going to run him a lot, you got to be a little – a little cautious. Not, not that Dillingham runs the heck out of the quarterback typically, right? I mean, not, most guys are not Jordan Travis. So uh, I like the receivers and and the, the weapons they have to throw to, though. Like this is a nice trio return. Jenna Conyers was really good down the stretch last year, I thought, and uh, I assume those those three will still be your sort of your top three: Badger, Sanders, and, and Conyers. But it, they took five or six transfers, I think, uh, at, in the receiving court. Who should we know? From, from the transfer portal there that's going to help Arizona State out? Yeah, this is really a, a strength of ASU's entire team is their, their pass-catching weapons. Um, and they've really sort of added to the, the main pillars that they had who are returning, as you said there. And Badger, 70 catches last year. Uh, we saw Conyers had 10 catches against Arizona, three touchdowns against Colorado. Blew up the second half of the season. Geo Sanders had 40 catches. But when we watched the team this spring – the uh, Idaho State transfer, Xavier Guillory, who was second team all-conference there, but maybe didn't have the type of uh, quarterback play around him to unlock some of his potential, he looked really great as a bookend uh, to what they have. And he's a three-level receiver, one of the fastest guys on the team, but he's a route runner, technician, doesn't drop the ball, also can get it in the screen game and, and, and make guys miss. Um, they added Melquan Stovall from Colorado State. He was a starting slot receiver before he elected to sit out um, last year to preserve an extra year of eligibility, right? And, um, you know, I think that he's a very shifty underneath guy that you can move around the formations, get the ball to him, kind of working laterally. So it's very complimentary in terms of the guys that they have. And um, then, of course, um, you know, they return Andre Johnson. He's uh, probably like in the five, six range. Jake Smith was a former uh, Gatorade player of the year, Texas, USC, bounced around, had injury problems, was off the field the last few years. He looked pretty good by the end of spring ball. So Troy, Troy O'Meara was uh, at Texas. He's a 6'5", 220-pound, almost like a hybrid guy. He's, he's such a big body. Um, so they have, you know, they have really talented uh, playmakers, and that is going to lessen the challenge as long as they can keep the quarterback upright and uh, hit on some of these vertical opportunities. That's where I was going next with this, because they, they do lose four of their top six offensive linemen, at least by snap count. Although last year, who was in, who was out of the lineup on a week-to-week -week basis was something worth following. Of course, you guys do a tremendous job covering them on a week-to-week -week basis with, with your excellent practice reports. They they took, what, five portal offensive linemen? It, are we expecting a major step back here on the O-line, or, or can they hold serve or – I guess maybe get better. I, I have a hard time believing that given that one of their kids went to Michigan, but he didn't play a ton last year anyway. Yeah. But Darius Henderson, he was their best lineman, but he got hurt uh, hand injury. Um, I, I think the guard position in particular is, is maybe the biggest question on the entire roster um, at tackle. They should be decently, decently good um, or, or better. They returned two guys who started a lot last year. Isaiah Glass, Emmett Bowley, um, they also got Aaron Frost from Nevada, who uh, had an ACL injury, but he had been considering leaving early for the NFL prior to that. Um, you know, he, a lot of people thought that maybe he could be uh, ASU's best offensive lineman if he's healthy going into this year. Um, they were cautious with him in the spring, so we'll have to see what happens there. They got Leif Fautanu from UNLV, who's a three-year starter to replace Ben Scott, who went to Nebraska. Um, it's not probably going to be much of a drop off there, uh, okay. if at all, actually. Um, but guard, that's where you have a question. Now they have Joey Ramos at right guard. He, uh, suffered a, a serious leg injury at the beginning of last year during the season and knocked him out in the starting lineup for the year. He's back. So he should be serviceable. Left guard was a big problem in practices and they went out and they got, 
uh, two uh, Division One transfers, uh, one from Texas Tech, who uh, Kay Briggs, he played a lot um, in, in uh, at New Mexico for three years before he transferred to Texas Tech, was a backup there. And then uh, they added another one from, from Purdue who has, has a chance uh, to, to be there, Sione Finau, who has a chance to be their, their starter, I would say. But um, definitely this is one of their more sort of uh, fragile overall position groups. And I don't think they're going to be particularly physical in the run game, which is why I think that getting back to having to be successful at run replacements, completing a high percentage, not taking negatives, quarterbacks being smart and avoiding sacks are some of the things that they're going to have to be able to do successfully. If Arizona State fans are watching us, I will say, uh, I do know Ken Dillingham does have experience with working with terrible offensive lines, uh, the 2021 FSU offensive line. Uh, we actually did a bit called, instead of Kenny Dillingham, we, we called it Kenny Rillingham. And so we took his press conference quotes, uh, what he said. He was, of course, being nice. He's not, not going to trash his players. And uh, and we kind of translated that to what he meant. And it, it was uh, it was a hard season for them, but they, they did find a way to score uh, score some points despite really, really ineffective blocking. So we'll certainly be tracking that. The defense last year, not that this matters a ton because there are, again, a ton of new players, was – one of the worst power five defenses with the exception of Colorado and Colorado is just kind of off on another planet as far as the rankings among P five teams, top three defensive linemen are gone by snap count. Are, are those guys actually important losses to this team? They, they seem to, I mean, they all stayed kind of healthy and played, but they took a bunch of guys in the portal. How would you project this unit, Chris? Yeah, I think that if you could have kept Omar Norman lot, like that would have been a very good thing, but, um, the the coaching was really quite bad last year. I, um, they didn't do the right types of things for their personnel. Um, they should have been a team that pressured a lot more and, and played press coverage on the perimeter with their big corners. And they were the least aggressive defense probably in the conference. You, you they go quarters without sending five guys once. And um, I just think that they didn't allow them to – put their players in the best you know, position to be successful, right? So um, they've done a very good job here, especially at the the end positions of rebuilding in a hurry. Um, Clayton Smith from Oklahoma looked quite good uh, as one of their better pass rushers. B.J. Green played mostly three tech, but he, he lost 15, 20 pounds. He's going to play some more end this year and be a guy that they can move around a little bit. Uh, Prince Dorba from Texas, he looks pretty solid. Uh, and then um, Garen Stansbury lost most of last season due to a bad hamstring that um, now seems to be, you know, recovered. He's 6'6", 245. And then Michael Matus um, this last year, he had, was a starter prior to that. He had an ACL in August. So um, I think at, at the end positions, they look pretty good. And what they've done now, they moved uh, Anthony Cooper from end to, to tackle. Uh, he was a starter last year as an end, and they've hit the porter the portal uh, pretty hard here with Deshaun Mallory from Michigan State, uh, bringing him in. And they got um, a Robertson, a, a backup, uh, a, a D tackle from Oklahoma, who started four games two seasons ago, was a backup last year. Um, so I think that they have – that's still maybe D tackle is probably their biggest – or one of their biggest question marks on defense along with maybe linebacker. But um, I, I feel like their style under Brian Ward, very aggressive and move guys, give them three-way go opportunities. And, and also the style in the Pac-12, right? It's not a – it's not a. they're not going to run a lot of power and run guys off the football with most of these teams. And so that gives you a little bit of a better ability to be successful. He, he, he made more – with less at Washington state. And I don't think that their personnel is going to be worse at ASU this year. Perfect. Yeah. I was going to ask you about linebacker L losing Robertson and, and, and so well were, I mean, those guys basically never left the field, a, a combined 1500 snaps between the two and, and played pretty well in the pack 12. They'll, they'll take a step back there. Just maybe not a huge one. Well, yeah, they're actually expected to get uh, probably going to get Tennessee, one of Tennessee's best linebacker transfers. Um, so that I think I think that's kind of going to be a big deal. And then they have Travion Brown, um, who comes from Washington State. He was their number three linebacker. So um, they're not going to be deep, but I think that they're going to, you know, and that's probably now 
the least important position on the field. When you think about it in terms of just kind of, you know, the way that football is played nowadays and they're, and they play a base nickel. Um, so you don't probably need as much there. And, and so I don't know, they, they, they couldn't end up being at least pretty decent at linebacker. They're just not going to be deep and they're going to have to stay healthy. Nice. Uh, I, one, you like, like spot on, on this defense that I, I am pretty excited about and hopefully I'm not wrong here. Corner. Like they appear to have survived attrition, and they have some players who, at least last year, were decent players. This secondary should take a step forward, right? I think so, um, okay. especially because the 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 Division One transfer safeties that they've added are really good players. Um, you know, they got Xavion Alford from USC was you know, probably one of their best looking newcomers in the spring. Um, he can kind of do everything: ball hawk, physical um understand scheme very smart and then shamari simmons is is um he was a all-conference player at austin peak at the fcs level but the transition has not looked that difficult for him at all he's more of a center field safety uh offers good coverage you know brings the wood though for somebody who's only 175 180 pounds and um then they have chris edmonds returning who has nfl upside probably as a strong safety big physical kid who also has ball skills. And I think as you're referring there, Ro Torrance coming back at corner, one of the biggest corners in the league, 6'3, 215. And he's going to be put into a better system uh, for kind of how to maximize his talents. And then Ed Woods is another starter uh, who's uh, coming back at end. And Jordan Clark was their nickel for the last couple of years, who's also returning. So you put all those guys together and then some of the pieces that they've added, I think absolutely that's the strength of their defense and uh, that's especially important because it gives uh comfort to your coordinator when you want to be uh, aggressive and bring a lot of you know blitzes and play man zero coverage or you know cover one kind of behind it that's brian ward's thing and i think that he's going to feel comfortable doing it i think that also fits what kenny wants to run on offense right he's going to be a guy that does want to run a lot of plays high, high tempo get turnovers if they score we get the ball back our offense gets a chance to score yet again not that he wants the opposing offense to score obviously but still like you, you don't want to play a bog down style if you're going to run enough tempo offense uh, like that traditionally what i assume just based on, on the conversation here you would grade them pretty well in terms of, of talent retention uh, from last year's roster when, when, when kenny got in there yeah um they lost maybe three or four players that i thought would have been in their starting lineup or at least two deep um not not many um really when you when you look at it they had a lot of roster length um the previous staff had just kind of taken a bunch of filler from the junior college level or level or flyers on some very undeveloped high school guys and um and then they took guys who were you know one-year players and so it was sort of a blank canvas that he <laughs> that dillingham was able able to paint upon and he got out all the paint uh, that he had because um, I've never, I couldn't have even imagined a scenario in which a team was going to add 50 players in five months like that prior to, you know, the, 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 the firing of Edwards was almost incomprehensible to me. Like when you cover, as you have college football for a very long time, like there's no, there's never been, uh, more than 30 or low 30s new players on a roster like in a year. So um, that kind of saved him. I don't even know if the job would have been that, you know, desirable uh, for Dillingham or others had it not been for that that rule change. And people are going to underestimate ASU this year, right? Because three wins last season and, um, you know, like a total overhaul of a roster, they're going to think, okay, they're not going to be that good. But um, they have eight home games. And the last two times ASU had eight home games, they won 10 games. Uh, I'm not saying that that's anything close to what should be expected this year. But um, they, they have plenty of pieces on defense to play the style that they want. As you said, they're very complimentary, right? They're going to be able to generate, you know, TFLs, get some turnovers, uh, get off the field on some three and outs. It puts the offense in an advantageous situation. They have the ability to hit some big shots in the passing game. They can run the ball probably decently well. Scadabo is a, a tackle-breaking type of a rusher at 220 pounds. So 
when you also have the weapons that you have in the passing game, which is probably better than I've seen it in terms of being four, five, six deep with weapons in a lot of years at ASU, um, I think they are going to score a lot of points and have the ability to make impact plays on defense. I totally, I, the one key here is going to be starting fast, not, not just in individual games, but like starting fast with, with, with the schedule. If you break this down in Southern Utah, Oklahoma state, Fresno, I, I think actually all three of those teams are beatable if you play really well. And maybe if those teams are at the lower end of the range that you might project them to be with, with Fresno losing Hainer, uh, especially you don't really know what they have behind it. And you get USC at Cal, Colorado, you need to get at least one of those. I, I feel like, and then mm-hmm. the next four or next five Washington or at Washington, Washington state at Utah, at UCLA, Oregon is, is brutal uh, before, you know, finishing off the year in the territorial cup uh, against Arizona. I, I agree. I, I think three does feel low here. Honestly, uh, where would you say is the spot that they have to stay healthy because the drop off between the starters to the backups is just extreme. Yeah, it's their interior offensive line okay. for sure. Probably D tackle and then linebacker between. Uh, I think that between Juwan Mitchell, the Tennessee transfer, and, and then uh, Travion Brown, the Washington State transfer, the only other guy that looks like he's like really kind of ready there for me right now is maybe Will Schaefer. Um, they, if they have seven offensive linemen right now who are ready to play, that is about as best as it is. Um, I, I, I don't. They might not even have seven. Uh, I'll have to kind of see these newcomers that they're adding. And get a sense for you know uh, Aaron Frost. The, the, they had a, the injury to Ben Coleman, who was supposed to start at left guard, replacing Ladarius Henderson. Um, he had a lower leg injury that is going to cost him most of the season. Oh. Uh, that was that was that was pretty. That was a pretty big deal. Um, so yeah, I would say you know uh, linebacker, interior OL, maybe D tackle. Those are some of the those are the key areas. Chris, really appreciate the time today. Everybody needs to check out Sun Devil Source. Awesome job. The best Arizona State coverage out there, bar none. Appreciate it, man. Thank you so much. Anytime.